Hi, welcome to Chair Chats, the lifestyle talk show with a disability twist. I'm your host, Pauline Victoria. On this episode, we're going to talk with Natasha Walton, the founder of the Tech Disability Project, which aims to increase the number of people with disabilities in the technology industry. But before we jump in, I want to remind you to please subscribe and share. And if you'd like to join my community, you can do that on my private Facebook group page called Victoriously Living. If you'd like what you see, please support us at patreon.com forward slash One Leg Up Productions. Natasha, thank you so much for coming on to Chair Chats and chatting with us about what you're doing to change the face of the technology industry. It's interesting because I saw what you're doing with the Tech Disability Project, and it's actually based out of where I'm originally from in the Bay Area, Silicon Valley of California. So um, I could totally relate to the high tech industry and how it is so important that people with disabilities are represented um, and included in the design process of technology. So I wanted to let our audience get to know you a little bit more, Natasha, about who you are, why you created the Tech Disability Project, and what is its purpose? Absolutely. Well, thanks again for having me. Uh, so my background is in technology. I graduated in 2008 and headed out to San Francisco. Um, the economy basically collapsed right around the time that I got there. And so I hadn't anticipated working in Silicon Valley. To be honest, I didn't even know what Silicon Valley was. Um, but I found myself there and my first job was working as an early employee at a, a, an unfunded startup for equity only to begin with. Um, but then eventually we raised around and I ended up continuing in the tech industry for about 10 years, uh, working mostly in uh, social media, gaming and enterprise software. And so to be honest, I found the tech industry to be exhilarating and wildly inclusive when I first got there, even as a woman, even though I, I was often the only woman in my company or, or in the room. Um, I, it was just such a cool community to be part of and such a cool moment in time um, to, to be in, at the epicenter of innovation. But as I started to get a little bit older and more mid-career and as I developed a disability in my mid-20s, all of a sudden I started feeling as though I was working in a less and less inclusive environment and I found it to be really tough to maintain my job, to maintain my performance, to be able certainly to progress on my career path while also managing a disability. And so in 2017, I ended up stepping back from the workforce for health reasons. Um, and when Disability Employment Awareness Month came around the following year in 2018, I was just like, okay, I don't have the time and energy and ability to work full time right now, but I have some amount of time and energy. And with it, I want something to exist for my community within the tech industry because at, th there wasn't anything. And to this day, Tech Disability Project is the only initiative, organization, fund, like there is nothing else in the tech diversity and inclusion landscape that centers people with disability. And I really believe that that needed to exist and so that's why I kicked off Tech Disability Project. As a consumer of technology, I see disability and technology so aligned because we rely on it so much. I mean myself, I use a wheelchair, I use you know smartphones, I use voice to text. There's so much with technology that is um am I driving? I it's all technology, right? Like it's all infused in our daily lives and to know that there is a lack of representation of people with disabilities um you wonder how much further could the tech world be 
for consumers with disabilities if there were actually people with disabilities helping design the technology. And I'm curious, since you almost, you had like a back door, you were in the back door with the tech world, um, and then the disability shifted your perspective. What did you find were the barriers or what created the barriers to allowing people with disabilities to get into the tech industry? Well, something that comes to mind right off the bat is that we don't know what disability representation looks like in the tech industry. No one is counting it. Um, I'm not sure of any major companies that disclose that um, or ask that of their uh, of their workforce. And similarly, we know that 70% of disabilities are not visible and that the majority of people, even with visible disabilities, choose not to disclose in the workplace. Um, and that's certainly true in the tech industry. And so if the people who do have disabilities and are employed aren't even able to talk about it, how on earth are we going to be able to create environments that really cater to our community and to help people enter the industry? Do you think they're afraid to disclose because there's this um, like presuppositions of like, oh, you have a disability, now we need to bend over backwards or we don't want you here? Do you feel like that there's that kind of energy in the workplace and that's why people don't want to disclose or is there another reason? It's a good question. I mean, the people that, the folks with disabilities that I talk to about disclosure, there's a lot of fear of the unknown. Again, because you don't see a lot of people doing it, there's, it's easy to jump to a worst case scenario, even though we're protected by the ADA and it would be considered discrimination for us to lose our job or not be hired or not be given the accommodations we need. That hasn't entered the cultural lexicon. You know, we're still, there's a deficit of disability representation in the media, in the culture, in business, you know, in every corner of our society. And so it's a lot of onus to put on a given, you know, job applicant or employee to kind of have to feel this big burden on their shoulders of how do I even make this decision and will there be repercussions on my financial stability or my, uh, my health insurance benefits if I move forward with disclosing this information. And do you think that's a culture from the companies or, or is it people kind of making up th thoughts in their head of like, if I do this, I may be discriminated against and or be in danger of losing my job and therefore I won't, you know, like, so there's, the company could create a culture and it makes you feel uncomfortable of disclosing, or you could already have made up fears in your head about disclosing um, and, and then you don't disclose. So then no one does it. So if not one person does it, nobody does it, right? So what do you feel is the, the crux of why they don't disclose? I mean, I do think that the culture in Silicon Valley is extremely competitive and aggressive, and there's a ton of ableism baked in into the way that we operate business in terms of the expectations that we have of people's schedules of people's time um there's there's definitely been um uh, an attitude of you know work has to come first and the company has to come first and what's your commitment to this company and certainly in the startup culture in terms of having your company and your identity as as someone part of a startup to to be the top identity in your life and for those of us who manage disabilities for those of us who um may need to put a lot of effort into managing our mental health who have a lot of appointments to go to um in particular and i think of folks with conditions that are dynamic and that are fluctuating like there's just not a lot of room to bring that to the table i think in an industry that is can be so focused on the bottom line and it's worth saying that there are so many incredible people working on so many incredible initiatives in diversity and inclusion in the tech industry so it's it's not to diminish the work that is being done and my experience of coming from Silicon Valley as kind of in that insider backdoor um, way that, that I had, and then moving into the tech diversity and inclusion space, that those spaces are 
feel entirely different and entirely separate. And in my experience, there hasn't been a real bridge um, yet that has emerged with all the great work that people are doing to bring that work mainstream. And I remain hopeful, especially with the events going on in the world around Black Lives Matter and around people taking equity and inclusion more seriously. I think companies have a major role to play in that. And I think the disability community has a major role to play in that too. Can you say more about what you think the differences are between those two worlds? I think that a lot of the folks working in tech DEI have come, come more from a non-tech background, whether that's education, social justice, um, academia. It tends to be, it, and it's wonderfully diverse and a really exciting, you know, area. And I think that the, there are different languages being spoken, and I think things that are taken for granted in the DEI space just haven't made it to the, the founder circle. Um, and I think, to, to me, this a lot goes back to venture capital. Um, we're speaking in early June, and Alexis Ohanian last week, who runs Initialized Capital and who founded Reddit, just stepped back from the board of Reddit. He resigned on Friday to make room for, he is saying that he would like a, a Black candidate, a, bl a Black board member to join um, to diversify that board. And what that that is really unprecedented because there is not a ton of traction around diversity, equity, and inclusion in the venture capital space at all. And ultimately, those are the folks signing checks. Those are the folks who are gatekeepers. And so, if so, so long as they have ha maintained this system of okay, if we're going to write you a check, you need to do 10x growth in three years or something. And so long as we're having unrealistic expectations of what founding teams can actually pull off in terms of like the the brain the needs that of brains and bodies of you know regular human beings um right now that's not being considered in the model in which we create tech companies and so you're seeing that dei is entering the conversations when companies get to a thousand employees or ten thousand employees or twenty thousand employees and i've tried initiating conversations with people in both vc and dei about like hey shouldn't we be starting this conversation a little bit earlier shouldn't we be and besides investing in underrepresented founders which is obviously important and i think that concept is gaining traction beyond that there really isn't a lot of connection being made i think between the two worlds is it is it fear on both sides or more on one than the other you think i think that the folks in tech dei are focused on you know both the things that are going to make the biggest impact and what's the lowest hanging fruit and then kind of working together um to meet in the middle and there's such an uphill battle that we have culturally um, and because DEI hasn't really made it to that seat in the table in that boardroom and those executive teams, I think that all we can kind of push for is incremental change often when really the systemic change that we need to be making comes from those decision making groups and I think that's what so many people are working on trying to, to, to shift the makeup of the folks that are in those rooms and at those tables and also increasing the education that people have about the, the impact on um, why DEI is not only good for the world, but also good for the bottom line. And like, I think there's still a lot of skepticism around that with business leaders thinking that DI is kind of a marketing thing um, and like you know okay we need to release a statement about this and that but not not really internalizing like oh if I were to fundamentally shift my business and center it around people who have been historically excluded and impressed that we would we would see a fundamental shift in our, our projected numbers like that is still a concept that is somewhere off in the future yeah, I was going to ask that question um, later on, but might as well, since you've brought it up, if there, yeah, if there was a shift where people with disabilities were able to uh, be invited more into the circles, what impact do you think that would make? Um, you mentioned numbers, um, and 
I'm curious, uh, you know, in terms of numbers, is there a way to project that if it would increase or stay the same? Um, if they had more people with disabilities working in the tech industry or, you know, are there other benefits that they think that you think would be a, as a result of them shifting? So in terms of the research that has been done and the data that we do have, um, I, I'm not going to be able to get it all right off the top of my head, um, but Accenture and Disability Inn and a couple of other organizations came together in late 2018, I think it was, and did release some research proving that companies who prioritize disability inclusion had a positive return on revenue. And so the, the, the data is there, and now the question that we need to go back and fill in is, okay, why? Like, what's important about that? What do we bring to these workforces? And when I think about it, just personally, um, so, so Crip Camp, the Netflix documentary that did so well at, at Sundance that tells the story of disability activism um, in, the, in the 70s and 80s, um, they have started this awesome summer programming where every summer we're having kind of a virtual camp and they have um, impact campaign leaders who are putting together some great programming and it's it's really cool for me to participate in because it's one of the most inclusive cross disability environments that I've ever been in. And that's something, you know, why I love disability, you know, disability advocacy work is anytime I'm in a space physically or virtually with a whole bunch of people with various different disabilities. Like it feels magical. Like it is unlike any other space because all of our access needs come together and some of them collide with one another. And there are all of these different incredible needs that we need to be met and seeing what it looks like to meet them, I think is why it, that's inclusion, right? And so something that I really appreciate about this Crip Camp summer virtual camp experience is that they move slowly enough to make sure that every single person is included. And Judy Human talks about this in, in her book, and I'm sure they talk about it in Crip Camp too, of just like when they were doing these, I think it was Section 504, when they were doing these protests for some of the first legislation that ever protected people with disabilities in the 70s, they were overtaking federal buildings around the country and for and they had to make decisions every day. Do we stay? Do we go? How long are we going to do this? You know, this is true grassroots community organizing. And Judy talks about how they did not start these meetings until every single person became present. And they did not wrap these meetings up until every single person had had a chance to communicate what they wanted to communicate. And I can't think of anything more contrary to Silicon Valley culture. Like, <laughs> Silicon Valley culture is just the opposite, right? It's like, well, this is when it's starting and we're probably going to, you know, if the founder's not there, then, then we'll wait. But if all the important people are there, then we'll start. And then people are, important people are going to start trickling out of meeting as soon as they need to. To, and then you know there's it's just it doesn't cent it centers the most powerful and I think what's cool about so much disability organizing that I get to be part of is that we center the most marginalized and when you do that when you flip that equation all of a sudden you create inclusion all of a sudden you create the space to make sure that everyone is going to have their needs met and that everyone is going to be able to participate meaningfully and it I am so excited to see what it might look like to bring those two different ways of operating, to, to bring this more inclusive way of operating toward the business world. I'm just going to push a little bit further. We, we use the word inclusion a lot, right? And um, for a lot of people, because I know moving from Silicon Valley to Hawaii, even in just advocacy or just friendships, it's a very different way of processing information silicon valley most of the mainland is very linear da, 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 we're going to do this a b c d and then hawaii culture culture is very circular like so it's very similar to what you're speaking about like oh we want to make sure that everybody is heard we want to make sure that nobody's feelings are hurt and in reality like silicon valley's culture is so like what you just described like we got to get the most powerful. It's all centered around the people that are the power makers and the decision makers. 
So inclusion, if you were to speak to those decision makers right now, so what? Like what, if, if we did tip it, what, what difference does that, would that make? So we're at this point where, you know, capitalism is a machine that always wants to grow. It doesn't care if there's a pandemic going on. It doesn't care if there's a uh, civil unrest going on. Capitalism, all it cares about is every quarter seeing things get better and better and better into perpetuity forever. Um, and venture capital works the same way. They're always looking for more growth. And so we say Silicon Valley, but there's also Silicon Beach and there's also Silicon Alley. And there's also all of these emerging tech clubs, not only around the country, but around the world, because ultimately you can't have every qualified founder move to San Francisco. Like we've tried that and we've seen how high the rents go up and we've seen how high homelessness goes up and we see all of the negative externalities of trying to pretend that there's a finite number of people who can make change and they all need to co-locate like it's and even with this pandemic we're seeing oh it looks like we actually can have a distributed remote workforce and we didn't know that was possible before and so I think that change is hard and that there are a lot of assumptions that people in power have been really holding on to tightly about the way that we can work and about who can participate meaningfully and that we're also tapping out on the amount of return on investment that that can be made we are always looking for new types of founders new types of companies new markets um, in the business world and it's not about saying you know th throwing the economy away or saying the economy is important or saying that return on investment isn't important that's not what we're saying but what we are saying is that the way that we're doing it right now is fundamentally broken and i think that business leaders haven't woken up to that yet and i hope that un until they do, we aren't going to be able to see companies that are creating truly inclusive work environments and truly accessible and inclusive offerings to their customer bases. I feel like there's so much hidden potential within the disability community that in the right environment, th there's it could be tapped into. And I think that a lot of the, de the decision makers forget that um, because they can only see what's right in front of them in the moment, right? They're in the meeting, they can see that, then they got to go on to the next thing. Um, and so would it be worth it to slow down? To like take a beat and follow the Crip Camp philosophy of let's everyone be heard um, because when everyone's heard, then perspectives can be brought to the table that may not have ever been thought about. And that what I said in the beginning is, how much further would we have been along in technology if the disability community would have been included? Because there are things that, from my perspective in life, based on my body and based on my um, functional needs, that I could have brought you know said hey this would have this would work great and as we see in almost everything that's been created for disability whether it be as simple as curb curb cuts or elevators or um uh closed captions like when the least um functional person is served then it serves everybody um i was having a conversation with somebody and and I was, we were talking about closed captions. And here in Hawaii, we have tin roofs. So when it rains, you can't hear anything. So people are like always turning up their TVs or what, using the closed captions. And the lady I was speaking to was like, oh yeah, I love closed caption when it rains. I totally, I, I, I use that when it, when it rains and I can't hear. And just asking her the simple question, so are you disabled or deaf? And her realizing like, no. Oh, okay, so it was your environment that created your need for closed captions. And you could see the light bulb go off. And it was amazing to see that because she got it. It was personalized to her. And I feel like if those kinds of conversations can be brought to the decision makers or the venture capitalists, um, then they can see like real, real shifts, you know, not just 
it's a nice concept. Inclusion, 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 it's a nice concept. But really, what does that mean and what could it look like in real world and for the bottom line? I don't know if you can say if there were tons of candidates with disabilities that were coming in, is there a lack of education for people with disabilities? And, you know, so they're not even thinking about going for those jobs. I don't know. What do you have any insight into that from your experience in Silicon Valley? I know that there's a company called Chronically Capable that's uh, founded by a woman who lives with chronic illness named Hannah Olson. And so she's creating a recruiting platform that centers candidates with chronic illness who would like to have flexible remote work. And so I think that's a great example of, okay, we have this untapped talent pool that has a ton to contribute and there are all these systemic environmental barriers to them not just interviewing, but also being able to work at certain kind of tech companies. And so how can we work with companies to actually educate them on what it looks like to create flexible remote positions where candidates can be successful? So I think that's an example of some of the work that's being done to improve um, this problem. I certainly can't speak to it comprehensively. I'm sure that there are all sorts of people who in our community who are being shut out of educational experiences, who are having um, accommodations. I know there are people having their accommodations being denied. Um, and I know that very few companies really put forward, uh, have, have a culture of requesting access needs during the interview process. And if we don't have a chance to have our access needs met during the interview process, how many people are going to not be able to make it to that position? And then how many people in our community are not going to be able to maintain their position because they aren't going to be able to have their access needs met at work, either because their employers are buffing them or because they don't feel comfortable asking for them. So I do think that we are early enough in disability advocacy in the business world that there are a whole host of issues that we could certainly be addressing. Yeah. You know, and even just hearing you talk, because I had to interview quite a bit in the Silicon Valley when I graduated in college, um, I was born and raised there. And I would always have to say, you, you go through the phone interview process first, right? It's like 10 different steps to get hired at <laughs> any company there. And the first step is the phone interview. And I'd always pass that like, oh yeah, we'd love to bring you in because they didn't see me yet. And then I have to say, great. I'm in a wheelchair, are you accessible? And even if they just flipped it and said, great, do you have any access needs that we need to be aware of so we can make sure that your needs are met? Like that would be amazing. And the other thing that I found really hard during the interview process, because there's this stigma of like, we can't ask any questions about their disability, was they weren't asking me the questions that needed to be asked in order to them in order for them to be put at ease right i had to volunteer and or find a way to finesse it into the conversation like how i type what would i do if i need something filed how would i answer the phone like how do i get to work like i feel like it's okay as someone with a disability it, I'd rather just talk about it and have it be a conversation of just something we have to deal with, right? Um, and it's okay to talk about it in a way that um, we just want to make sure that you're able to do the job. And if there's anything on our end as the company that we could do to help you do the job. Uh, the Tech Disability Project, let's bring it back to that. What is it that if someone was watching this and was their interest was piqued in the tech industry, how can they learn about the Tech Disability Project? Um, how could they get involved? So you can visit techdisabilityproject.org, which and signing up for our email list is probably the best way to stay in touch. Um, and feel free to reach out directly. Uh, my email is on the, the website as well. Uh, and we will be starting a link 
in group. And so that's going to be another way that folks can connect with each other. Um, but the last two years, we've done um, awareness campaigns in the month of October, which is National uh, Disability Employment Awareness Month. So two years ago, we did um, a Medium blog post campaign where about 20 folks in the tech industry with disabilities just wrote about their experience navigating their careers while also managing a disability. And so you can read those stories there if that would be interesting to you. And then last year, year, uh, Adobe hosted us for a panel discussion with a number of uh, folks from various tech companies who run employee resource groups for people with disabilities. So employee resource groups are a fantastic part of the diversity and inclusion landscape, usually at larger corporations, um, and there actually aren't that many companies that have one established for people with disabilities. So anyone in the corporate world, I think that's a great way to get the conversation started at your company is like hey can we start a group for us and being i was the first person at adobe to to raise my hand and start recruiting and it is scary being the first person and someone needs to be the first person at every company and it's doable and i'm here to support anyone who wants support in that process of getting the conversation started because i knew at adobe that if i needed this group that other people did too and sure enough once i raised my hand and started organizing folks people came on um, including some allies including some caregivers but a lot of people who identify um, and it's really empowering being able to take a break um, from your day in the business world, which often isn't super inclusive and meet with other folks who identify and just like have this kind of safer, more inclusive space for an hour. Like it's, it's really great. Um, and so last year we did a panel with ERG leaders and um, that's recorded and also on our website for anyone who's interested in um, hearing that conversation. And uh, now we're speaking in, in June and this summer we're starting um, an organizing committee for anyone in the community who's interested in contributing to the vision. And so um, we definitely, uh, any, anyone is welcome to be part of that. And uh, I'm sure that we will be getting something together by October um, that will likely be virtual again, um, given the pandemic, but also given the access needs that we have, you know, disability communities often been digital first. Um, and so hopefully we'll be able to include more people this year uh, than ever before. So it's not necessary for you to be in Silicon Valley to get involved and um, contribute to the Tech Disability Project, correct? Definitely not. Um, we had folks um, participate in both of our campaigns from around the country and around the world. Um, so yes, definitely not limited to California or the Bay Area. And, you know, I just want to take a minute, Natasha, I'd love to hear your personal story or experience, if you're willing to share, about when you came out um, to your company. How was that? Because maybe someone's feeling the same way and they just would garner the encouragement and empowerment from your story? Let's see, my company was, I was working for a startup that was acquired by Adobe, and then I almost immediately went on medical leave, which is a new benefit that I had as a, an employee of, uh, Adobe has some fantastic benefits, and I really needed to take advantage of that. And when I came back, I was kind of new at the company and newly off medical leave and feeling really grateful that I had had um, that that need met through that really important benefit that I wish every company would provide. And I reached out to the staff member who ran diversity and inclusion, who was super supportive of me during my time there and having that one ally, that one friend, that one person that I could turn to um, definitely fortified me. And I expressed interest in growing the group because um, one person had um, made sure that it existed and it helped name it. Um, who was in a different office, but didn't really have the bandwidth to recruit for the group or lead the group. And so uh, in, in that month of January, this is 2017, uh, there was the first kind of community group meeting at Adobe and all of the different groups, whether they were the social ones or kind of the company sanctioned employee resource groups had a table. And so we agreed that that was kind of the best place to start was just to have a table. And I asked a friend um, who I had met through the women's ERG and we had put together that we both had chronic illness and we had been supporting each other. And I was like, will you sit at this table with me? And she said, yes. And that was so big. Um, that was hard for me to ask and put that ask out there knowing that 
it is personal and, and not everyone is up for it. Um, and it was big of her to, to show up. And I think if I had been sitting at that table alone, you know, I would have still done it and it would have been a little bit harder and I would have probably shed a few more tears than I did. Um, but definitely asking a friend and even if I had asked a non-disabled friend, I think that would have really helped to just not be sitting at the table by myself. Um, and then I remember actually, so this, the day before had been the women's march, the first one. Um, and it was such a big moment, um, in the women's movement. And I was somewhat newly disabled, did not have a firm handle on my access needs and how to get them met. And I couldn't participate in the women's march. And that, that felt really lonely. And I was really sad that I didn't know how to connect with this movement that was technically inclusive, you know, meant for me. Um, but that Sunday instead, I was like printing out the signs for the table that I was going to be sitting at the next day at the community fair of my company. And so it, I felt a little bit lonely doing it. And I, I've, I've felt a, as fantastic as the disability community is and as plugged in as I feel now at a, a lot of starting tech disability project and starting access Adobe, like there was a lot of loneliness and frustration at how little existed and frustration of how few disabled people I knew. Um, and, and, and so there, there was some loneliness. I don't want to put, you know, rose tinted rose colored. Um, but it was really meaningful and we had maybe 20 people sign up and, then I did it at the San Jose office too, and we had some more people sign up there. And then a few weeks later, we had our first meeting and maybe we had 20 people come from offices all over, um, people dialing in and sharing their story. And it was incredibly moving, um, especially that first meeting, seeing people be resourced and connected who had never been resourced and connected together and hearing people resonating with one another's stories and questions start popping up and you start to see patterns of like, oh, that could be an interesting thread to follow. Um, so that was my foray into kind of disability community organizing and it it fundamentally changed me I realized that, that I enjoyed it more than my day job and product management and in many ways I've kind of never never looked back and have continued down that path that that employee resource group opened up for me Wow well thank you for your courage for being first and for putting yourself out there that's a lot it, it does take a lot of um, courage and it sounds like you had a lot of passion for it and that's what helped you go through the tears and wipe away the tears and um make the hard asks from people but uh the fruits of that you know is probably so beautiful to hear everyone come together and bond over such shared experiences even if they're in different parts of the world or different you know, parts of the industry, you know, the tech industry is not just engineers. <laughs> There's so many, so many facets to the tech industry, but um, I'm sure that so many people appreciated the support and I'm sure that you've got so many outpourings of, of gratefulness from people that were able to participate because of your courage. If you are interested in learning more about the Tech Disability Project, and getting involved and um, being part of this movement. It really is part of a movement, right? Like the disability movement. There's so much happening in our world today, even though it's focused on Black Lives Matter, it really encompasses a whole shift of seeing the value in each person, no matter what they look like. Um, thank you for making your, your, you know, little footprint in this whole disability movement, but in the tech industry. Um, and I'd love to hear from you, our viewer, what is it that you feel would help you enter, whether it be the tech industry or any other industry, um, to have the courage to stand up and say, this is what I'm dealing with and this is what I need help with. And who wants to join me, right? Like essentially that is what you said. Um, so comment below. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this topic. Um, I also wanna remind you to please subscribe and share if you haven't already. And if you'd like to join my community, you can do that on my private Facebook group called Victoriously Living. If you like what you see here, you can support us at patreon.com forward slash One Leg Up Productions. 
Thank you so much. And until we meet again, be blessed.